Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. I'm really excited to share today's guest's story with you all. And before we jump in, I'd really appreciate if you could take a moment and rate the podcast on Spotify or on Apple. And this is going to allow the podcast to reach more people. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and today I'm joined by Jen Pilati. Jen is a movement educator and author, author, and she's also a GMB trainer. We connected back in 2017, and uh, it was really nice. We, we met in Austin, Texas, but we actually haven't chatted since then, but I've seen Jen's work. It's been fantastic. She's you know done tons of things since then, so I'm really excited to jump in and talk to her about all things movement related. So Jen, Thank you for taking time out of your day. And thank you so much, Connor, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. So for people who don't know a bit about your story, um, do you want to jump in, like how you got into the industry? Uh, Also, maybe, you know, just to clarify what you do, because you do a lot of different things. So I think it'd be cool just to kind of, uh, you know, what's your approach? I think we'll really dive into that in more detail, but maybe just start like how you kind of got into it and how things have evolved over the years. Okay. Sounds good. Yes. I got into it because I originally wanted to be a doctor when I was in university and I got my very first chemistry test back and looked at the grade and went, "Hmm, I need another route. So so I kept studying sciences, even though I was really pulled towards the more liberal arts, like writing and English and psychology, but I kept studying the hard sciences. And by the end of it, I had accumulated enough credits to be an exercise science major, exercise physiology major. So that's what my first degree is in. And I was hired by a country club to be a full-time personal trainer. This was way back in 2002. The industry was very different. So I did that for about five years. And at one point I was I thought I knew everything. I'm like, oh, I know everything there is to know about fitness. I need to get out of this. I knew nothing, right? But like, <laughs> <laughs> and someone I talked to said, you have a choice. This is something you're passionate about. You love movement. You are so fortunate to be in this situation. Not everybody can actually have their career be what they love. So you either become the very best that you can in your field or you just let the movement thing be a hobby and you find something else to make your money. And I thought about that and I thought, gosh, I think I want to try and, you know, keep on this path of letting my work and my hobby be the, this thing, this merged thing, but I'm not happy with the way I'm currently approaching it. And I'm not happy with my current knowledge set. So that sent me on this journey, which has extended well over a decade and led me to many different things, including GMB. It led me to another master's degree. It's led me to postgraduate studies in psychology. And so that's kind of where I got to be how where I am today. And the result of that is this confluence of several different modalities and ideas that influence my work and what I do, which is why it's kind of hard when you say, what do you do? I'm like, well, I do a little of this and a little of that. <laughs> totally. Yeah like 2002 so like 20 years Dude. which is <laughs> but like it's it's amazing it's, the cool thing is it, it, it's it's quite rare in the industry like I'm 11 years in now and I'm rare um yes. it's unfortunate because I think we need way more coaches we need, need way more trainers yeah. so were there any maybe patches you know let's look at 20 that mm-hmm. kind of initial decade we'll say 2002 up to 2012 whatever and that you were mm-hmm. kind of like, yeah, this is not like, you know, because when I look at you now, like, you know, published author, like you're just, you know, you're kind of where everyone wants to get to with their career. So um, were there f- points along that journey that you were kind of like, I'm going to get it like a real, a real job, <laughs> you know? Oh, so much. So, yes. In fact, I don't know what it was like in Australia in 2008, but in 2008 here in the States, there was a global recession or a, a, not global. It was a national recession. It was mm. bad. And for the first time in my life, since I had graduated college, I had clients that moved out of the area. And at the time I was doing everything in person and I didn't have anybody to replace them. And I had zero marketing skills. That was not something that I wanted to be good at or had any desire to study or understand. 
And so I felt like I was at this like crossroads. I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? I started looking at other types of careers. And every time I thought about doing something different, I'm like, I just can't see myself sitting at an office and not interacting with people all day. So I started blogging. This is when I started writing. 2008, Uh, was it? 2008, yes. (laughs) Because I thought to myself, even if I don't know how to market, even if I'm not, even if I'm too shy to go out and like introduce myself and say, hey, I might be able to help you, I can at least write about what I do. Mm -hmm. And in the process of that, which was really, I think, sort of cool, it helped me clarify my message and helped me clarify my understanding and helped me sort of figure out where it was that I wanted to go. Mm, yeah that's so uh so true like i i started writing in 2014 on the internet and i took two years out so i worked like 2011 2012 in ireland and then i uh, went to asia for two years uh, but i started a blog there and i wasn't really actively coaching people i did a little bit of yoga teaching but just writing about the stuff then when i went back and i started working as a pt in melbourne I was like, I knew all of the stuff. Like I was just like, God, I, I really, you know, my, my knowledge base is actually like I've maintained it or even improved it. So I'd really like to kind of dive into your writing process. Cause you're definitely mm-hmm. someone who I would say is, is, is prolific. Like you're super consistent. Uh, you know, you've obviously written a book. It's they're very clear. There's a lot of research clearly behind your writing as well. It's not just something that you've kind of put together in, in 10 minutes. So how does that work and how has that evolved? Maybe you can talk about how that's evolved over the last decade for you. Of course. I think one of the things people forget about writing is like anything else, it's a skill. And when you start doing it, you, you're you pulling information, you're pulling inspiration from like, like it's like, it feels like you're grasping at straws to find inspiration. I gave myself a challenge at one point where I would write Wednesday musings on Facebook when Facebook was still kind of a thing. And every Wednesday I would write a short form blog. Mm -hmm. And that meant that every like Sunday I would start thinking, okay, what am I going to write about? How am I going to make this short and interesting and relevant for the general population? And so that was, was one way I started to develop that skill. And then on top of it, when I went back to graduate school, I, it was all online, which actually suited me really well because it meant that everything I did was in written format. And so I started writing these more long form, you know, papers and whatnot that were fully backed by research. And I found that I really liked that as well. So when graduate school ended, I just kind of kept that up. And the result of that was when I sat down to write my first book, I wrote it in six weeks, I think, (laughs) but I'd already done all the back work, right? I'd already been writing about these concepts and these topics in reading through the research for, for many years. So like synthesizing it was not difficult. Plus because long form is something I've always enjoyed writing. It wasn't as daunting as it would be, I think, for a lot of people who are like, oh, my goodness, how am I going to come up with 70,000 words? <laughs> I didn't think of it like that. I was like, OK, I'm going to write chapter one and I'm going to see how it goes. And then I'm going to write chapter two and I'm going to see how it goes. And since then, it's it's fun. I actually have written two more books, one of which is going to the publisher September 1st. So it's just it's something that's like in me. It's something that I do. Cool. Yeah, it's it's uh, one of my clients. He's a child psychologist in Ireland. He's like very, very well known. He writes for the paper. He's written like three books. He said something similar because I asked him like he's been writing, you know, an article a week for the national paper for I think 15 years, something crazy <laughs> like and he said the same thing to you as you you did. Like he said, like he his writing day is Monday. So at the weekend, he's just kind of thinking about, you know, so then when it comes to sitting down on Monday, like he's kind of ready to to kind of get the words out. So do you have like a, a routine or habits that you kind of do weekly? Do you write every day? Do you have specific days? Like how do you set up your week? I do write up. I do write every day. And often I write before I start work. It's on days like today because I'm starting a little bit early. It's it was 730 here in the States. I'll write on my lunch break instead. The other thing I find I think is extremely important if you want to 
again, continue to draw inspiration. First of all, you have to be out in the world. There has to be some of that because where does inspiration come from? Working with people, you know, all of those are sources of inspiration. But then reading books. And I read every night. It's just, again, it's this thing that I do. And I read, I do prefer nonfiction, so I'm not a fiction reader, but I read a lot of different types of books. I just finished a book about biology. I'm reading a book right now on the power of silence in a world of noise. Uh, you know, I try to draw from, I read biographies, you know, so I'm constantly reading because when you start to read and you start to read different from different fields, you start to see the underlying patterns and the connections. And that's, what's really interesting to me. It's the same with movement. When you study lots of different movement modalities, you start to see the underlying themes that come up over and over again. And you think this is interesting. This There's gotta be something to this because this person over here who doesn't know this person over here, they're saying the exact same thing in slightly different ways. Why? I love so that. That's, yeah. It's really funny because I've been doing this podcast since tw- uh, October last year. And uh, Andy, who you know from GMB, he said the same thing. He was like, he is very good at synthesizing lots of different ideas and then creating something new. John Goodman said the same thing from Online Trainer Academy and Keegan Smith from uh, <laughs> ATG. So I was like, you know, <laughs> thinking the same. You know, it's creativity, really, um, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Can you give some examples maybe on maybe through the lens of movement, I think it would be interesting, uh, you know, maybe like you, you've, you you know, you started a PT, um, you know, Bachelor of Science in, in Kinesiology, if I'm correct. So yes. like what sort of things have you seen now, like 20 years on, you're kind of like, okay, these are kind of the fundamentals underlining all systems that work well. All systems that work well, in my experience, the thing that seems to make the biggest difference is understanding sensory input and how that impacts motor output. It really is that simple. And every system does it a little bit differently. You look at a system like GMB, that's a terminology that we both know. And we actually both know yoga. I studied yoga for 10 years. But within GMB, one of the things that is brilliant about the system is the warm ups. So they seem super simple. You know, you're doing these little wrist exercises, you're doing these little spine exercises, but what do they do? They help the person determine, oh, that body part, that's where it is in space. Now I'm going to move it into something bigger. I'm going to do this frogger or I'm going to do these pull-ups or whatever the thing is, or I'm going to use the rings, whatever it is. I now have a sense of that body part and I can easily incorporate it into the movement, into the skill. Okay. And it's, it's simple, but it's, it's super smart. And all, every system that I've studied, I mean, you look at like Ido Portal's stuff or Erwin Lacour's stuff or, you know, where's the magic happening? It's not happening in the big movements. It's happening when they say, okay, we're going to slow down and do these little explorations. And that's when people suddenly, you, you see light bulbs go off and it's like, oh, you know, that's how that works. So you're saying like the initial, like using the warm up of like, that's a wrist prep, you're getting that sensory and you're, you're bringing it into like a very localized part of the body. So it's easier to kind of get that uh, response, I guess. Uh, and then it's giving people more mind body awareness. Is that what you're getting at? Exactly. Yes. Which again is, if you look at how the brain determines motor output, it takes all of the information that it has internally and from the ambient environment. And it uses that information and says, okay, this is the perfect, this is the way you, we're going to organize the joints given all of this information. And if you're missing information, the movement's going to be incomplete. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing when you listen to people instruct, people who are really good at it, they're it, like Ryan, for instance, their instructions are very precise. They're simple, but they're direct and precise. They don't use a lot of words. And it's easy for the brain to go, oh, okay, I know what to do with that. 
And it's the same with when I've studied with a lot of like contact improv people or even very, you know, really excellent yoga teachers. They'll say one thing and you go, oh, I can totally do that. Instead of what a lot of us do, which is a lot of words. Yes. Super interesting. Like the art of cueing. Like it's so, I always really like what you just said there. I'm like in a class or I'm working with someone and they say something and I'm like, that makes so much sense. Like my, <laughs> like my body knows exactly what to do versus someone saying like, okay, now you're going to depress your scapula and externally rotate. Like it's like, <laughs> uh, so one, one thing along that I think would be interesting to maybe dive into to hear if you've any thoughts on it is like a lot, you know, I'm very body based. My mm -hmm. system, I've, you know, I've been in movement my whole life. So my kind of connection would be very, I guess, strong. I, I can kind of feel stuff, my, my awareness around my body. But then like the kind of emotional or the kind of psychology side was non-existent up until like four or five right. years ago. And I've been working hard in that area as well. So for, and, and I've had a lot of conversations with clients as well, that they're like, I don't know what you mean by, you know, feel like I can't feel what you're saying. So yeah. can you maybe, uh, you know, riff on that a bit? Like, first of all, mm -hmm. why that's happening? I think, you know, as a society, we're very disconnected from our bodies. And then maybe what are some, you know, steps people can take to start to um, practice that to get more, I guess, embodied, if that's the correct terminology. Yes, I totally agree with you. As just kind of a culture, I think we're very disconnected from our bodies for a variety of reasons. We don't use them in the same way that we used to. And we don't really think about them. We take them for granted, even though there's this underlying prevailing idea that, yes, we're non-dualistic, which means the mind and the body are connected. Even though almost any practitioner you talk to will say those words, <laughs> we don't always actually practice that. You know what I mean? Totally. So I think that's definitely kind of one of the reasons there's this pretty strong disconnect for a lot of people, even people who move a lot. It's really interesting. You ask them to slow down and feel or even speed up and feel. And there's a little bit of a disconnect. They're like, wait, I don't, I don't quite know. Like you said, I don't know what you mean. So there's that. The way I have found for people who are not body people who are not super aware to kind of bring them back into their bodies and to start to help them experience things. I, I'll use like a lot of different textures. Like I have a client right now who's, she had a couple of different surgeries, one on her neck and one in her abdomen in a very short amount of time. And it really threw off like her whole connection to her left side. This isn't uncommon. Surgery is a trauma. It's an acute trauma. And for some reason, doctors here don't prescribe physical therapy afterwards. So, <laughs> so often I'm kind of left picking up the pieces as best as I can. But for her, some of the things I'm having her do include, you know, putting a weight on the left shoulder, feeling it with both hands, but then feeling how that helps her anchor down through the left side of her body, you know, and then I'll have her do things like take a soft ball, place it on her knee when she's seated, put both hands on it, press into the ball, slide the ball down and up. The change in texture gives her brain feedback about how her arm is moving, where she is in space and how that's connecting with her foot and pelvis. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And then even like, I don't know if you studied some of the fighting monkey stuff, but I've done a few workshops, but I haven't like gone into detail, but yeah, but yeah, continue. Cool. Yeah, because their work is very much based on what's cool about their work is it's a little bit faster and it's based on kind of quickly identifying where different body parts are in space while you're doing a specific action. And that is another way for people to go, oh, that's, you know, to start to sense different parts of their body without having to like stop and say, okay, wait, where is it, you know? Because I think both are valuable. I think you need to slow down and feel, but then I also think you need to move and experience. And I feel like often what happens in a lot with a lot of different movement practitioners is they get really fixated on one and not the other, rather than trying to use both. Totally. Yeah. I when I did the apprenticeship around the time I met you, I was doing everything really slow and mindfully, and then I kind of got weak. In, you know it's kind of like you start focusing on this one corner 
and then you neglect all this like explosiveness impact all this kind of stuff and then I was like actually pretty compromised especially with my lower body so that's something I've been working on a lot more now like my feet to get back running so they can actually you know my ankles just don't break when I try and run (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah so I guess let's um go into maybe detail for people listening like if someone or yeah what what do you think is common traps you see with clients so let's just say I'm not sure who's the first of all maybe who's the kind of normal client you tend to work with like what's the type of background or age and then maybe what are the common issues roadblocks you see with that person and then uh, what kind of recommendations do you make I'd love to hear that Yes. So my the age is broad. I work from young people to seniors. So I definitely have like a wide age group. However, I do have a very specific type of person that seems to be attracted to me. And it's really intelligent, anxious introverts. So (laughs) (laughs) these tend to be people who, for whatever reason, the traditional movement world or the traditional exercise world hasn't worked really well for them. They've either felt like they were at risk for injury or they experienced something that they didn't care for. So they're hoping to kind of get into shape without compromise. And this is part of the anxiety, right? Without injuring themselves or without putting themselves at risk. So one of the common roadblocks I see with a lot of people is they want to do way too much too soon. And it's so funny because people are, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this working with your clientele people and stop me if I, and I, if I'm wrong, please tell me, but you know, people be like, I was an athlete in high school. It's 20 years later, mind you, but I was an athlete in high school. I can totally do, you know, four workouts a week and start running three days a week. (laughs) And then they, they do that. And then they come in hobbled, you know, the week later and you're like, well, what happened? Well, I did all this stuff and now I don't feel great, you know? So kind of reeling people in. And even though these are the people, like I said, that are scared of hurting themselves, they they think, I think it's the perfectionist attitude. Like I need to do this. I'm making this commitment. I need to go all in. So that's definitely a roadblock I see for people. The next roadblock I see for people is not pushing themselves enough, which I think is where the value of a coach or a trainer is actually really helpful because people, and I get it. If you've been injured, there's fear. Or if you think you're weak or whatever mindset you have regarding yourself, there's fear about pushing. So people will kind of put on the brakes and rein themselves in. And a good coach or a good trainer can look at the person and really gently start to give them the baby steps to move over the hurdle to get to the next thing. This is one of the things I think with something like handstands or going upside down, right? It's super scary for people unless they've done it their whole life. So you give them the baby steps. And then when they actually go upside down, oh my gosh, how empowering and excited are they? Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing I think that from a coaching perspective, I try to really impart on people who take courses with me and things is, you know, your role as a coach is to provide reward. Challenge someone enough that it's interesting teach them something so they're curious and then let them experience some sort of reward because that reward is what keeps people coming back and consistent that's an awesome uh, framework so challenge teach and then experience slash reward yeah that's great that's like super like condensed like how to be a good coach i love it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well, I think that's I think that's important. You know, I think sometimes we lose sight of the role of what a coach actually does. Totally. So. Yeah, and it, like everything you said, it's it's the exact same thing I see with clients. Like, I think it's also the you know a lot of the messaging in the industry. Like, you put on David Goggins, and you're like, yes, I'm going to run through a wall, and he's <laughs> awesome. Like, he gets you going. But like, if I do what he does, I'm I'm going to break my hips basically. And the same with my clients. Um, yes. And then you're like, okay, like I'm just not. I'm going to avoid that stuff because it hurts me. And then of course, when you avoid stuff, you get weaker, and then you get even more compromised with injuries. So I think that's definitely having someone to be like, no, no, you're good. Like you know, actually keep going, um, and you you can do this. And then yeah, a lot of times it is just that kind of reinforcement, and then people have that confidence. Is like, oh, you know, he or she, they're they're telling me it's okay. So 
I can actually do a bit more. And it's like, wow, I can't believe I did that. That's crazy. I never would have thought that. Um, I see it myself as well when I'm working with a coach and the coach is just like, no, no, keep, you know, you're on the right path. Like just keep going. And it's so powerful, even though it's kind of simple when you think about it. Um, and then, yeah, for, for me, it's always like, no, no, like you got, like you did all the work. I, I, didn't, I didn't do anything. I just kind of <laughs> totally. told you this is the path. But like you did everything, you know, I'm, there's no voodoo here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally. Um, okay, cool. So like, what do you generally do then for those, that, that kind of client avatar we're talking about? So they're, you know, highly intelligent. They might be overthinking stuff. They might've had a bad experience in the past. And then they, you know, they watched uh, <laughs> David Goggins video. <laughs> they really hurt their shoulder or their back. <laughs> And now they've been kind of shying away. Like, how do you kind of, what, what are the steps you take over the first kind of four weeks with that person? It's super interesting. The first four, it's, and clients who've worked with me will tell you this. It's a funny thing. The first four weeks, for instance, the movements I choose are very simple. They're very targeted. So they really help the person kind of feel specific aspects of their body and kind of tap into things. And my goal behind the first four weeks is for the person to finish the session and go, I feel different. I feel, and you, and they can use whatever word they want in that next, next area. Usually it's, I feel more grounded or I feel more connected or I feel more aware. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the first four weeks. And it's very funny because again, clients who have worked with me, they say they, they're kind of, the, it's like the feel good phase. Like, okay, I'm going to make you feel really good. And then things kind of uptick a little bit. And then at some point, clients will tell me, they're like, whoa, this suddenly got kind of hard. Like, what happened to the feel good? Because <laughs> <laughs> you need people to get strong, but you need people to trust you as the coach. You need people to trust the process and their body. So people are trusting you. They're trusting themselves. There's a lot of trust that goes on in this sort of relationship you know, so that's kind of the, that's what you have to do in the first four weeks is establish the trust, establish the communication, make sure the person knows, Hey, if something doesn't feel good, tell me I'll reroute. I'm very mellow. You know, all of those things I think are critical to establishing a good relationship. Because if you look at oxytocin, which is the chemical that's released when there's a connection between two people, that's a huge part of what coaching is. You know, Sorry. if you look at all the reasons coaching works, it's so much more than just this person is prescribing these exercises. Mm, I've only heard that in relationships. So that's, it makes sense. Like you're getting a positive experience. It is a, it's, it, is, it is a relationship as well. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so you're basically getting that buy-in from the client. It's almost like you're, you're doing the opposite. Normally, I think as an industry and for me as a young PT, I was like, oh, I need to really show this person that I'm really, that I can give them a great workout. <laughs> so I'm going to annihilate them for the first few weeks. And then the person is just like, this is, I feel terrible. Like this guy is going to kill me. And then they quit. And, you know, I was yeah. that trainer as well. And now people are coming to me because they've had that experience with, you know, the version of me 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I, I think it's just getting buy-in. Like I've had, um, I remember one lady in um in Melbourne, very, you know, super driven, very like kind of type A, a lot of CrossFit, F45, yeah. super strong. I think she was fit, you know, in her early 50s. And uh I remember getting her to come to the classes and I was like, Do you want to try? And she's like, it looks kind of silly, like it looks kind of <laughs> easy, like you're just kind of hopping around. Yeah. And then like six to twelve months later, she's like, I can't believe how strong I am. Like I'm the strongest I've ever been in my life. Like how, how is this? This doesn't make sense because I'm not training as hard, but I'm stronger. Yeah. So do you want to maybe talk about what's happening there? I'd love to hear your, you know, from a science point of view and then from maybe from like habits and compliance as well. Yes. Well, and I think for, if for instance, in that woman's um, instance, and I think we forget this. I was actually, I've been taking pole dancing. And I was just talking to two of the teachers last night, one of whom's in her late twenties, one of whom's in her thirties. I'm in my early forties. And the thing that happens as you get older, you can still do all the things, you know, I am stronger than I've ever been, but I'm also way more efficient and more effective in how I work than how I've ever been. 
So that's, I think, what you learn as you get older. So for instance, this woman in her 50s, I am I I would suspect that the joint work she was doing, I'm assuming it was some sort of GMB type workshop with like the like, you know, like the um, frog or monkey, all of those things. She became more efficient. And the efficiency is going to lead to more strength which is so cool because you have to work less hard to accomplish the same thing. And if the goal is to be active throughout the entire lifespan, that I think should be the goal. How, you know, how efficient can I be to do this so that I can keep doing it 20 years from now? Mm. And that's something I do try to impart with clients when I'm talking to them, because I don't do a lot of, you know, I've read all the research. I know that four to six sets of, you know, like six to eight reps is going to make you maximum. I know all of this is going to make you maximally strong, whatever. I also know that a lot of people don't have the patience for that. A lot of people don't like that. And a lot of people have zero interest in doing programs like that. Get that too. Like again, from for the clientele that I tend to work with. So instead, <laughs> clients know that if I've chosen something difficult for them, I'm probably only going to make them do four to six reps. I'm only going to make them do it two to three times and then it'll be over. <laughs> 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 and that seems to create a higher level of like, okay. And they also know that generally if I choose things appropriately, the way hopefully I do as a coach, that each set will get a little bit easier because I'm having them focus their attention on something that will make the movement a little bit easier. Can you give an example of that with some, like with a specific exercise? So let's just say like a barbell deadlift. If what a lot of people will do is they lift the bar up is they lift away from the ground rather than pushing their feet into the ground the whole time. So simply, you know, if you say to the person, okay, I want you to think about pushing your feet into the ground the entire time, the movement gets easier. Or if you say, pretend like you're holding a hundred dollar bill in your hip crease at the bottom of the movement, when you start the movement, really squeeze that hundred dollar bill and then come up that too will make the movement easier because that little bit of compression at the hip before you start, like boop, pops you right up. So there's a few, like just things like that. Like once you start to understand how movement works and how, you know, levers work and all of that, you can really help a person become a little more effective in what they're doing. Yeah, that's awesome. It's funny. Like that, those cues are just absolute gold <laughs> that you just said. I can see <laughs> clenching there at the front of the hip is going to get, it's basically compression strength, right? Um, totally and like you just go whoop yeah <laughs> it's cool and then on the way down am i am i doing the same thing because I, I tend to i'm like taking notes on this like it, it, on the way on the <laughs> way on the way down should i be still uh doing that compression on the way down because i'll normally kind of yeah forget on the way down essentially and like just kind of stop the weight i usually just come down and then reset and come back up with it Gotcha. But you can play with it. You could totally play with it, depending on like how heavy you're lifting and all of that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Very, very good. Um, have you do you know anything about the long and short range strength stuff? Like I do the, not. Yeah, it's very cool. It's like um Keegan Smith, you know, ATG, uh, like mm -hmm. Ben Patrick, all these guys are using it now. And it's it's basically like an example would be for the quads, you would do like a leg extension would be short range strength um, okay. or like a, a reverse step up or something like that. And then mm -hmm. like, a, you know what a human knee extension is when you're... I do, yeah. That would be like long range strength. So you're, you're strengthening the muscles oh. to full length. Um, and they're basically, you know, you're, you're using short range strength to help prep the joints before you train or to rehabilitate them. Smart um but yeah i've been doing that type of training for the last kind of six to nine months and it's you know finding it really really effective uh, as warming up but i was just curious if you if you had any thoughts about it um, i mean it makes a lot of sense i think anytime you're working just you know different angles it starts to help a lot of different aspects of movement totally yeah so 
let's jump into a bit more about your influences. So obviously, you know, super long career in the fitness industry in particular. Um, who would you say are three people that have kind of influenced your path the most? You can say more or less if you want to. Influenced my path in terms of how I've structured my career or in terms of my uh, like philosophy and how I work? Uh, let's go with both. So maybe someone specifically <laughs> movement related and then maybe like how you, you moved in that direction as well. Okay. Oh, gosh, these are hard questions. So there's two people who have probably influenced me significantly in terms of my movement philosophy. And that would be, I would say the G I'm going to say the GMB guys because Jarlo, Ryan, Andy, they all bring something a little bit different to the table, but they're all very effective, I think, in what they do. And they showed up and I did that apprenticeship at kind of a pivotal point in my career. So that was, um, so that was, their philosophy was quite helpful. And what then- What year was that, Jen? Sorry for interrupting. What year was that, that you did it? I believe it was 2016. Gotcha. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So that would be for that. And then Adarian Barr has taught me just a ton about levers and the effectiveness of, of teaching movements. So that's, he's been another one that's really influenced like my philosophy. So those, those two groups, I would say. How do and you pronounce term, that person's name? The Adarian? A D A R I A N, yeah, and his last name is Bar B A R R. Okay, great. And then, in terms of like my business and that aspect of things, gosh, there aren't many women. So, I owned a fitness studio for a long time, a gym, personal training gym. And there weren't many women doing it at that point in time. There was Rose, actually, I'm going to butcher Rose's last name. Do you, is it Kaluchia? Is that how you say it? I have no idea. <laughs> you know Rose, though. Oh, I know who Rose is. I know Rose well, but I have no idea how to pronounce her name. Sorry, Rose. <laughs> Rose, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. We don't know how to say your last name. <laughs> so Rose was actually quite helpful with a lot of that. She helped point me in the right direction for business stuff and gave me lots of ideas. And during COVID, she was really helpful and just kind of helping me with ideas in terms of how to keep going and pivot to online and all of that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. What's your own training like and nutrition? So, you know, mm -hmm. what's kind of a normal week for you? And then maybe how has that shifted over the last, you know, three to five years? So I'm silly consistent. This is why I'm able to write books. So there hasn't been much shift in my training in the last three to five years, other than sometimes things get added in or, you know, at, things get subtracted or added in. I wake up, I go for a run or a walk, and then I have my movement practice, which lasts about an hour. Currently, I am not working with a coach, though in the past I have worked with coaches, which kind of depends on you know, what, what my goals are at the time. And then usually in the late afternoon or early evening, I'll do what I call rolling around on the floor though. Now that I've added in pull, sometimes it's more like flipping upside down on a pull. <laughs> and that's usually if I'm not going to a class, it's like 15 minutes of just kind of, you know, reconnecting with my body, tapping in down, regulating a little bit. If I'm going to a class, it's more like an hour of spinning around and flipping upside down. <laughs> and so that's my movement practice and then um my nutrition I'm mostly vegan I do do eggs and chicken on occasion and I'm, I just I try to eat pretty clean you know as minimal processed foods as possible and I'm not too fanatical about it but I am aware of I have a lot of dementia and Parkinson's that runs in my family. So I'm highly, I'm like acutely aware of the importance of B vitamins for your brain health and, you know, all of that. So that's. Gotcha. So like kind of, uh, is that five days a week every day or you're doing kind of that hour of kind of strength and then kind of like almost like a play kind of session as well, right? Yes. 
Yes. Cool. That is, I would say that's about five to six days a week. Okay. Awesome. So I'm, I move a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a, quite a bit of movement. <laughs> um, with the fitness industry and with the fact that you're, you know, the, the kind of, the kind of movement industry can be quite like esoteric, kind of like yoga. Yes. And then you're yeah. also heavily in the evidence based uh, with, with the research side of things. So like, how do you kind of balance both of those, those versus like anecdotal coaching experience as well? Uh, or, you know, what are your thoughts on, 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 on that question, basically? <laughs> totally. So what's super interesting about science, and if you read papers, I've read a lot of papers, a lot of papers. I, I did graduate school in 2010. So I've been reading, you know, research since then, because that's when I got into that. So that's 12 years what you'll notice is researchers cherry pick information. They're, su- they're as prone to bias as the rest of us. They will publish papers with very small sample sizes <laughs> and you can find a paper that proves anything you want. So knowing that, once I understood that, I was when I was doing graduate school at the time, I was really into barefoot running. So I was trying to find evidence to support, you know, gate mechanics and running and how this all worked and the quality of the research was horrible and then it it was crazy I'd read the research and then I would see like a major publication like the New York Times write an article about this paper as though it were true and I'm like well there were only six subjects and they ran on a treadmill and they didn't prove anything (laughs) were these like pro pro barefoot or or against barefoot they were just at the time it was very much during born to run. So it was all. Pro oh yeah. yeah. Um, great, great, book. <laughs> great book. Yes. Yeah. Once I understood that I started to realize, okay. Research is one aspect of the equation. The most important part of the equation is a person's lived experience. So, and what I mean by that is my client's experience not my experience, but my client's experience. So I can know all of the research in the world about low back pain. And I can sit with someone in front of me who has low back pain and I can start throwing out the different protocols. And if none of them are resonating, none of that stuff matters. (laughs) So the way I think the science is actually really important is again, if you can understand the fundamental principles that allow movement to take place that is way more effective than knowing you know which muscle groups activate when or what type of plank is most effective for activating your transverse abdominis and whether or not you should be in a posterior tilt tilt or a hollow body while you're doing a pull-up like none of that matters (laughs) If you understand how movement works, <laughs> you know, so that's what I, and part of that's the body or the mind part, like understanding the psychology of all of it. So that's how I use the science. Awesome. Yeah. It's, I think a lot of the time as fitness professionals, you can kind of get caught in the weeds and dogmatic about like, yes. you can't bend your spine. You you can, or nutrition yeah. is obviously the, that's just a different story altogether Uh, (laughs) so for someone listening let's just say like they're in 30s 40s busy overwhelmed uh in pain you know so they Mm -hmm. have aches and pains they probably know that like look i i really need to start addressing this stuff like this is getting worse every year um but they open up instagram facebook tiktok and it's just like oh my god (laughs) like He's telling me to so do this much. and he's telling me this is going to kill me. And it's like, <laughs> what am I, I just, I'm just not going to do anything. So like, what yes. would you say is just kind of like some really like fundamentals, like look, if you're starting, do ABC and regardless yes. of who you listen to, that's going to get you started and, and it's going to be helpful for you. Yes. So the first thing I would tell anybody listening who has aches and pains is start to feel your feet, figure out how your feet work against the floor, figure out how your feet anchor you or ground you or whatever word you want to use and feel how your feet move you. Connect with your feet. Like if you can connect with your feet, things will, yeah, 
<laughs> things work a whole lot better. So that would be step one. Barefoot or in shoes or it doesn't matter? I prefer, well, whatever's going to give you the most sensory feedback. Um, I have clients that will not take their shoes off. That's fine. I can, you know, I can ask them to feel different parts of their feet in their shoes. If that's the way somebody wants to go, great. But if you're willing to take your shoes off and play a little bit, that can be really helpful. Awesome. And if you're willing to do that on different surfaces, like on grass or on concrete or on rubber or whatever, like that can be super helpful. It gives your brain so much really good information. So much information. Like there's so many sensory receptors down there. <laughs> mm, amazing. Okay. So connect with your feet. Uh, the next thing I would say is move your spine. And if something... If you're scared to move your spine in one direction, that's totally fine. Make the movement tiny, like see if, and see if you can move different parts of your spine, you know, like play with, can I move my breastbone? Can I move my neck? Can I move my belly button? Can I move my pelvis? Can I move them in different directions? Just move your spine. Just let that be like a thing, you know, cause that's a, again, this is a huge part of your body and we're scared to death of it, which I understand why. <laughs> <laughs> your your just... your back's gonna explode if you if you round <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. uh, but the rigidity doesn't do anybody any good. So move your spine. Cool. <laughs> You'll feel better. And then probably actually the third thing would be move your shoulder blades. Mm. People don't even know where their shoulder blades are. And their shoulder blades, your shoulder blades are they they're they connect your lower your upper body to your lower body. They allow you to move your arm, like move your shoulder blades. Yes. Can you maybe dive sure. into that a bit more? Because I really only when I got into gymnastic strength, I was like, oh, there, this is a this is a thing. Like my, sho my shoulder <laughs> blades, I didn't know they existed, like you said. So yes. um, can you maybe say Seven. why that's important and the benefits? And yeah, I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. There are 17 muscles that like cross your shoulder blade area. So for, it's a hotbed of information. But on top of it, like if you look at the structure of the skeleton, again, the shoulder blades are what anchor you to your pelvis. And they're what give you freedom in your arm. So your shoulder, if you look at the connection points, right, you've got your acromioclavicular joint, which is the acromion process of the shoulder blade and your clavicle. You've got your scapulothoracic joint, which isn't a true joint, but it's your scapula against your thorax, right? And then you have your glenohumeral joint, which that's what we all think of when we think of our shoulder joint. That's the upper arm where it connects into the glenoid process of the scapula. So <laughs> the scapula is huge. <laughs> if it's not moving, if you can't identify how it moves, then that's going to throw off everything all the way down into your lower body. Sorry, that caught me a little. Yeah. Yeah, no, Strong that's... believer in your scapula. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's just like, that's so um, beneficial because like, if I think of the three places that everyone I've come across, myself included, are disconnected, it's my feet, it's my spine, and it's my scapula. 100% like, it's like, you know, uh, yeah. you don't hear people talking about it either. So it's just really nice to you know, for you to actually reinforce that. Um, that's huge. Okay, cool. So address the feet, get a feeling of the feet, uh, start moving the spine, and then start moving the, the scapula. Yes. Okay, amazing. Uh, we're going to jump into some rapid fire now to finish off. So okay. some quick, quick, quick questions. Um, who would be your ideal dinner, desk, dinner date and why? Do they have to be alive? You can do dead and alive. So two separate answers. <laughs> okay. My ideal dinner, dinner date would probably be Mabel Todd, who wrote the book Thinking Body, um, because she was a female in an industry that was dominated by men. And she was such a forward thinker. Oh, how, how long ago was that book published? 1935. Wow. Maybe. Okay. All right. And then a uh, person who's alive person who's alive oh my goodness ah I'm trying to think of someone I don't know because there's lots of people I know that I'd love to go to dinner with um <laughs> oh yeah you can know the person 
You can know the person. <laughs> I can know the person. <laughs> oh, you mean you just mean friends? <laughs> like, is it her? <laughs> well, people in the industry. Um, yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me think for a second. Ooh. Oh, I actually don't remember his name. I can send it to you. I listened to this podcast recently with this neuroscientist and neurosurgeon who was fascinating. Cool. And his view on the brain and meditation and how to keep the brain like healthy and, and, you know, kind of plastic and, and continue to learn throughout your lifespan. It was a really good podcast. So I'd probably say him, but I don't remember his name. So I'll have to look it up for you. Yeah. Send that through. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I will. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, for what are you most grateful for? Oh, I'm so grateful for just my mind and my body for my health. Awesome. If you could wake up tomorrow with a special ability, what would it be and why? With a special ability? Yeah. Oh. Oh, there's so many. Um, I think the ability to be weightless and flip and easily leave the ground would be just amazing. Uh, and I say that because I, so vestibular input, like it for, it's the reason I like pull. It's the reason I like handstands. I love flipping. I don't know why. It's just a mm. thing. So to be able to do that easily would be so much fun. <laughs> for sure. Uh, what is your greatest accomplishment and why? Uh, well, I would say opening my first studio was actually a pretty great accomplishment. And I did it by myself. I was young at the time. I didn't think so. I thought I was old, but I was 33. Um, and I made it work. And I, I think that that taught me a lot. It taught me that I could do it. It taught me that, you know, I have the ability to be both a business person and still good at my craft. So that's what I would say was probably my biggest accomplishment. For sure. Books. What books would you recommend? You're probably going to have a long list here. Uh, <laughs> let's go with um, movement. So specifically movement, exercise related book, and then something else that you find interesting that people you think would be beneficial for people. So something else I think would be beneficial for people. There are two. The book Gratitude by Oliver Sacks, which he wrote while he was dying. It was beautiful. It was lovely. Oliver Sacks is a neuro, he was a, an, like a brain guy. He wrote all kinds of books about the brain. Super fascinating. But Gratitude's lovely. It's small, it's tiny. Um, I actually thought Tribe by Sebastian Younger was also excellent. Again, it's small and it's an easy read, but it te I, for me, it taught me something. And then when breath uh, when breath becomes air, when breath becomes air. And I can't remember the author of that, but he too was a, he was a back surgeon who just finished his residency when he was diagnosed with incurable brain, uh, with incurable back cancer. And he died, but he wrote the book while he was dying. And it's, be it's beautiful. Just all of those books gave me just an interesting perspective of life. Mm. So, um, which I think is invaluable. Yeah. Totally. So I recommend all three of those. And then, oh gosh, on the movement side of things, the wisdom of the body is quite lovely. And that's written by, gosh, I don't remember the, uh, she's a student of Bonnie Brainbridge Cohen's. I don't remember her name, but it's a, it's a lovely book. And she, Bonnie Bainbridge Bridge Cohen's actually, that's who I would also go to dinner with. She's brilliant. And again, a female in an industry dominated by men. She occupational therapist, circus artist way back when she was young. And then she developed the, her own system, just super smart. So that book is excellent. And then what other book would I recommend in the movement world? Um, the thinking body, I think is, is, it's interesting to see where all of that comes from. That's a lot, a lot of the somatic stuff comes from some of those, some of her thoughts. And, you know, Gray Cook's book movement, Gray Cook's book, what a, what a thing. Gray Cook's book movement is actually a nice exploration of what movement is. So even though I don't utilize a lot of his techniques that he discusses in the books, like his philosophy, I can really appreciate. Cool. Okay. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely covered the, the book side of things. In particular, the, <laughs> the initial three, like I, I haven't read any of them, but they're all definitely seem to be around uh, appreciation. Like Sebastian Younger, he's the war journalist, isn't he? Yeah. So it's very much like, yeah, just seeing, I guess, looking at death as well. Um, yes, which I think we're, uh, as a culture, we're very afraid to do. Yeah. We're afraid of the impermanence, but it's, if you recognize the impermanence, it gives you the gratitude for every day. So, you know. Yeah, 100%. Uh, okay. So last question, if you were okay. to put something on a billboard where millions, if not billions of people would see it, what would you write and why? Move for your mind, not your body. Amazing. Love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Because I truly believe that. So that is why I would put that on a billboard. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of times people think about movement, about like, okay, I need to lose weight. But like the mental yeah. health benefits are crazy. The productivity <sighs> benefits are insane. Um, so yeah, that's super, super interesting. And yeah, Jen, like I had such a, I've learned so much from you. And it's also great to see your, like your energy being in the industry for 20 years. Like you're still clearly extremely passionate about what you do. So for people listening to this who want to check out more about you, your services, your, you know, your book, all these things, like what's the best place to send everyone? My website, jenpilati.com. And then I'm also on Instagram, though Instagram recently changed their format. And I'm not sure how much I like it, <laughs> but at jen underscore Pilati is my handle. Amazing. Okay. Again, really appreciate connecting with you. And I think we'll definitely do a round two at some point as well, because there's a lot more things I want to pick your brain on. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> awesome.